Howdy folks, this is Jagos and this is the special Inafune report. Let's go into a bit of background on this and why this is a long report. I plan to make 9 different videos on 9 different topics culminating into talking about Inafune and his business practices. However, that's not the way I usually do things and it's been especially hard to do. Instead of focusing on the chaff and the riffraff, I've decided to go back to my roots and focus on what's most important. The top. There's a focus on Inafune and how his decisions affect the companies and people that work underneath him. This is a documentary done for the Mega Man and Mighty No. 9 communities whose voices were silenced and why this company is not exactly the one everyone thinks it is. Of course, there are other people inside the company that do certain things here and there and we'll get to that. But you're free to go over it as you will and take the information or leave it. When I do an economic video, I follow these three rules. Number one, numbers barely matter. Number two, focus on the top. Number three, workers don't matter. I explain all this in the beginnings of my Capcom report, so I won't do it here. However, as time has gone on and I've learned more, I do have to expand on rules and explanations to them. We'll start with number four, CEOs are bankers. Let's be very clear here. A CEO's main mission is to bring money to shareholders by any means. John Riccatello was pressured by the board of directors to bring home the bacon and was ousted because of a bad bet called the Sim Shitty Fiasco. He was given a golden parachute for failing. The workers got a golden shower. Which do you think you would want? In this society, we treat bankers like rock stars and here the CEOs aren't much different. Just look at how Inafune is treated and not really doing much with the Mega Man series besides getting others to keep up production. But that comes later. Right now we'll get into number 5. Capitalism is a gamble. When you follow the effects of capitalism, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Grab your parachute because what can happen is that you can place your bets wrong and lose everything. However, if you stack the deck or hedge your bets, you can have stable income. Look at Capcom and Kenzo Sujimoto. 30 years of owning Capcom allows him to have his own wine garden in California while his workers don't get much from the experience except the claim to fame for good games. Did Sujimoto create a game? No, he merely owns a company. The workers don't do anything but create profit for him as he decides where the proceeds go for the banks that own his company who want more money each quarter. As such, remember that in every transaction, whether on Wall Street, Main Street, or Game Street, it's all about the risk and reward. Why spend money for a new Street Fighter when you know it'll be a microtransaction on costumes? Why buy the newest installment of DMC when you know it is just a constant money maker for Capcom? Are they really going to do the new features that would make it a great game or just outsource the product to a third party while trying to pray that the quality isn't too bad? We know what happened there. Check this out for details. So where do we begin? Well, we began from the beginning, if anything. Inafune was a man working with five others to create Mega Man. Contrary to popular belief, he didn't help the team as a person fresh out of high school, but he likes to rewrite history as him being the victor. He garners a lot of respect as the quote-unquote grandfather of the Mega Man franchise, but this is inaccurate. The person who created Mega Man was Tokuro Fujiwara, who had made rather difficult games and left the industry. For the most part, Inafune helped with Street Fighter pictures in the arcade game as he slowly rose through the ranks of Capcom. This is rather important. Some of the connections made in Capcom will go to benefit him later on in life while he began to become dissatisfied with the company. The main reasoning in his interviews is his own business ethics from what can be gathered. He wanted to be the CEO of his own company and call the shots. This couldn't be done as the vice president when he had someone else to answer to. But understand that his sentiments on the industry have run back for quite some time. Japanese journalists have allowed him to speak his mind openly and he's had quite a lot to say about what his wishes are. そうですね、あの、全体としての
だからあの日本はただ昔のようにきめ細かい配慮だけで、えー、世界で勝負していくっていうのは難しくなってるんでもっと新しい試みであったりとかチャレンジを、えー、欧米以上にしていく必要があるようにはなってきましたね。Sadly, his main wishes aren't the creation of a Mega Man game as fans have wanted. But first, let's go into the Mega Man franchise. If anything, Inafune is the reason that such a series was dragged down so severely. I recall playing the first few games of Mega Man. Hell, I even read the books. They weren't really all that innovative, but they brought in a certain amount of cash and revenue on the Nintendo. Out of all of them, Mega Man X is my favorite, but let's be clear. Between the anime, the games, the books, and everything else, too many things were put under that label for too long. What ended up happening was a market saturation of titles, which brought down the stories of all of the games and the continuities. Merging Mega Man X with Mega Man just by the Wily vi virus may have sounded nice, but be real. Eventually, Light and Wily continued to be used, but the robots kept coming, keeping the platforming games stale and redundant. Nothing could really be written without the main character archetypes, and overall, people would be sick of those style of games. So, new markets were formed. Network games and other games fell into the Mega Man platform while saturating markets, and overall, that became the new norm for certain titles. Slap an older franchise with a new game with a few different mechanics and watch the money work. It's a decent system. It would eventually fail to bring anything new to the table. For Inafune, he would begin to complain about the Japanese system in 2008. Now, this is important to recognize. He'd been decrying the system for quite some time, and all of a sudden, the new one was supposed to make the creators like him, fresh out of college, better? How? From there, we go into the middle mobile market, which is essentially where Inafune disappeared. No real games were made, nor did he do much noteworthy until the Kickstarter proceeded. Now, for full disclosure, I didn't fund the fiasco. After hearing so much about this, I got curious and investigated the campaign after Dina's became community manager. But with more to say on Inafune, I'm relegating Dina to a bit more than a footnote in this video. If you want to know the situation with her, I'll explain it after we get through with Inafune. Dina is honestly not that important, no matter what she says on Twitter. Even here, it's best to take a step back and understand that there are parallels to other fiascos. One such event occurred after Mighty No.9 was funded, but with what happened, it helps to put this into perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you how the Mega Man fans got Shaq Food. And I want to talk about Shaq Food. That's right. I want to talk about how they hustled the community. And not just hustled the community in general at large, when I mean the gaming community, but also hustled the news. They hustled everyone when it came to media because there were larger forces at work to get this going. For those who don't know, Shaq Fu Part 2 has reached its goal. That's right, it's reached its goal. And there was something fishy about that. All right. And I said before that Shaq could afford to make this game on his own. So let's hear what the Indiegogo guys, you know, the developers of this game say about those, you know, about those claims. With the new Shaq Fu, we want to revive the classic old school beat em up, but for a new generation of gamers. At the core of the campaign is our desire to collaborate with the gaming community to create something truly unique that people actually want to play. We've had a lot of criticism about the idea that Shaquille O'Neal, this rich guy, is asking for other people's money to make his game. First of all, that idea is completely wrong. Yes, we could have taken the money, gone off, made the game in secret, and released it, and made a bunch of profits from selling full price copies of the game. Now, that's not very interesting. What we've chosen to do instead is create an Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign to raise some money as well as create awareness and publicity about the game. You know, you've got to love idiocy. And I will put it like this for those who actually pay attention to what that guy was saying. He sits here and says that people who are saying that Shaq has the money to do it, they're completely wrong. And then he says right afterwards, you know, we could have took the money, but we decided to go a different route. So you're saying that Shaq does have the money. He does, right? You just contradicted yourself. And then say, but we want, you know, to, to reach out to the fans and give the fans the control of what they want to play. You're trying to give the fans the power, the community the power. But people, you don't understand. The community never had the power. And I'm going to prove that today. However, I want to see first, you know, what they had to say in the comments in that video. Since, you know, he says that it was absolutely ridiculous, 
that, you know, that Shaq could have paid for on his own and then admits he could have right afterwards, so he contradicts himself. Let's see what they have to say now in the comments. So first you say it's ridiculous that Shaq could pay for the whole thing. Then you admit he could have paid for the whole thing. Then you're saying that he is financing majority of this. So what was the point of this? And then you say, well, it was to create awareness. What awareness? You're not creating awareness if he's paying for most of it or your buddies are paying for most of it. It has nothing to do with the community. Like I said, I am going to prove that right now because no Indiegogo, uh, was it, campaign we have seen when it comes to gaming in this nature. All right, for a game that pretty much nobody remembers, and the gamers today they, they sure as hell didn't play it. You know what I mean? But when it came out, it was absolutely atrocious. Are you going to tell me that it's going to hit damn near every goal that it has? And we're talking high roller goals, from two thousand dollar goal sellouts all the way up to thirty five thousand dollar goal sellouts. This is not the work of the gaming community, especially in these large chunks because anybody who was keeping up with this campaign this was happening most of these happened over the weekend when during the final stretch of their goal there's no way that you were going to find tens of thousands of dollars to all of a sudden throw to Shaq Fu too especially when it doesn't even have the fan base or following hell even the mighty number no. nine that had a huge following didn't even reach these marks there is no way that this is the work of the gaming community at large so now the question is who is behind this? We just talked about not too long ago that you'd be lucky to get gamers to donate, what, $1,000? We just saw this Shenmue 3 Kickstarter when they asked in the poll. They wouldn't even do donate $400 to $500 because gamers, that's just a steep price. Yet we are seeing tens of thousands of dollars in a short time span, mind you, short time span, being donated to this game. And what I mean by that is not crowdfunding. No, these are single donations. That's right, $10,000, $25,000, $20,000, sorry, $1,000. You got $35,000 by single donators. This is not the work of the community. So who is behind this? Guess who's behind this? Quark. That's right, they're a part of this. Quark PR, for those who don't know, on Twitter, they did it since last week, I believe. I spoke about Shaq Fu 2, briefly spoke about Shaq 2, and a Quark person came in and, you know, tried to defend the game, really defend the game really quickly. So... Over the weekend, when I looked at the donations, and I will talk about this a little bit more, because due to the fact that when I was looking at it, it had 57 hours left to reach goal, and it needed like $50,000. By Sunday came, right, it needed $20,000, which if you can raise that much money in a day, because I looked at it on Saturday, and then Sunday, it was like, wow, that, that game it had a big jump in a day. Then Monday, we started noticing, it was like, look, there's seven hours left, and they were down $20,000. So you knew what was going to happen. It was like so close to $20,000. It was like $433,000, something like that, right? And I spoke about it that Monday morning. And what happened? Quark PR guys came in and tried to, tried to defend it to the end. That's right. And I said, hey, what are you doing? I'm not like, all they did was keyword Shaq Fu and find people so they can defend the game because it's part of PR. And he tried to deny that, you know, this was part of it. Really? Well, let's look at Quark's timeline on Twitter. Nothing but Shaq. Why? Because they are heavily invested in this. You want to know why? Because Quark is for digital currency. And if the microtransactions go through them, then they get money. And if you don't believe me, they try to sit here. You can ask John Candy 45 because he jumped into the conversation. We were telling him, leave us alone. Because he was like, I just want to give you guys some quirks so when the game comes out. Mind you, when the game comes out. They were still down about $20,000. When the game comes out, okay? And if you looked that morning, the, they said the prices were jumping up. They just kept jumping up. But the backers weren't changing. So, yeah. Something's questionable here. Something's going on. But like I said, they still need $20,000 within seven hours. Let's see if they pull this off, right? So we're telling the guy, leave us alone. We don't care about your quark. Why are you even, you know, why are you even a factor right now? We don't care. And he's just trying to give us free quark the whole time. And Johnny Candy was like, yo, pretty much fuck off. What's your problem? And what do you do? He started, he started following John Candy 45. 
stalking people on Twitter to PR the game. This is what their campaign, their so-called crowdfunding, because the gamers were supposed to be involved, this is what you've resorted to. You understand it? And if anybody needs more proof on just how involved Quark is, let's look at their Facebook page. On their Facebook page, nothing but Shaq Fu 2. Matter of fact, they're urging people to push that, you know, that final push to donate more Quark. Not only that, but they even have their own in-game item, branded item for the game. And after that, we all start taking a closer look at the backers in this campaign. Quark, Quark, and more Quark. And the thing is, if it's private, you can't tell how much they donated. All right. So if you're keeping it private, it must have been a big sum on top of the also anonymous donations. But of course, you can't check the name, but you can see the money. But that's not all. Other people started picking up on the scent. And on GoNintendo.com, an interesting comparison between Colt County and Shaq Fu crowdsourced fund efforts. As it states, there are some metrics for you. The failed Colt County Kickstarter had almost the same number of backers as Shaq Fu. It says, only difference was the average of Colt County backer level was only $30 per. It says, Colt, County ba Colt County's backer distribution looks much more normal. High end tiers all untaken, lots of backers at entry level tiers. It says, unlike Shaq Fu, which again, mysteriously nailed all of the top tiers, except for the 4,000 one they just added today, it says a thousand people put in for Colt County at uh, fifteen dollars, cheapest price for in-game. A hundred and fifty-eight put in for fifteen dollars on Shaq Fu. So out of a thousand plus, only a hundred and fifty-eight put in for fifth. That's entry level, fifteen dollars. Okay, but that's not all because we're going to get into it. Then we saw the actual goal within those seven hours jumped up like that. Someone put in that extra twenty thousand dollars. So let's look at that. When Shaq Fu all of a sudden gained that extra $20,000, there were only two, that's right, two current backers. One at $55 and the other one at private. So that should tell you exactly where the money came from, Joe Winner. But when you click on Joe Winner's name, up comes Matthew Karch. For those who do not know who Matthew Karch is, he is the president and CEO of Saber Interactive. The very same Saber Interactive that is leading big D's who are developing the game or helping the game get made. So what did we learn today? Seriously, what did we learn? It goes to show you that they tried to hustle the community. Well, they did hustle the community. And what I mean by hustle is they gave you the illusion that you actually made a difference, that you had a chance to change things. Because as we see with the totals, if it was up to the gamers, this wouldn't have made it by a long shot. This was done by Quark and apparently a lot of rich backers. Why did the CEO all of a sudden put in all this money to make sure he got over the hump? Because think about it. Would you rather take $20,000 of your own money and take a hit, which you can probably get later down the line? Because these are donations, people. All right. Or would you rather give back $433,000? You see what I mean? They weren't going to let this go. Quark has too much invested. All these backers have too much invested. These big rich backers have too much invested. This had nothing to do with the gaming community. And yet, even CNBC said, well, crowdfunding's latest, you know, celebrity success. So they're gonna try and make it as though this was really something that the community was in for. Gamers did not want this game. But I'm sure there are some who did, but understand that those gamers got taken for their money as well. Nobody had anything, when it comes to the gaming community, had to do with this. This was all business, all companies, all over again. That just gave you the illusion. And it's sad, because within all this, you know, they talk about all the great things that Shaq does, especially with that Quark. I put like this. If you go back now, because the success is over, you know, it's a success, the campaign is done, and Quark, I'll put in the info bar, they even wrote, you know, congratulations to Shaq Fu too. I went back on Twitter today to see if that guy at Quark Press or whatever was still, you know, trying to sell people on the idea. This is what happened. Now that you know how to Shaq Fu your fan base, let's understand that this is only one story not covered by the journalists in the industry. So let's talk about them. I had the longest time in trying to figure out what bothered me about this section of my video. Then it truly hit me about this. The people I'm trying to talk about aren't journalists. They have no integrity, they're willing to push one-sided narratives, and they want to use your anger and rage against you in order to pad their pockets. Who wants to be associated with Ian Miles Chung, whose one role is to pass along nonsense and call it news to people higher on the food chain than his ignorance? But let's look at this, shall we? 
Lee Alexander is known for her hatred and bigotry on more than one occasion. When she can, she silences those that disagree with her so that their voices does not conflict with her megaphone. Now I bring up two extreme views to point out that these are certainly no paragons of virtue. From the hypocrisy of Ben Cuchetta to the sensationalist nonsense of Jonathan Holmes, these bloggers are effectively a part of a business model of sensationalist rhetoric instead of journalistic integrity. You are probably wondering who these people serve. It certainly isn't the public. Even Silicon Nero will whitewash things for people so long as you're a publisher or a developer. Looking at how a moderator on NIS was unpleasantly forward with a woman on their board while not saying, saying much on the Silicon Nero review. Speaking of Silicon Nero, let's not forget that they are indeed plagiarists who can apologize worth a damn to the original work of a cited source. Links to both will be in the underbar and I'll allow you all to decide for yourselves. Here's the thing. They are not on your side. Shocking news to you, I know. But they're supposed to be the marketing arm of publishers, which hasn't changed much in the new millennium. Hell, even the small guys get flagged for trying to report fairly, and I'm sure I'm going to be watched for what I have to point out next. But here's the thing. I do this shit for free. These guys are paid to make waves, and they do the lazy route of pointing fingers at their audience. Why? For me, it seems to be a consolidation of the marketplace. One-sided views having been going into the industry with little ways to counter the main types of diverse gamers. From what I've gathered of the industry, they've been rather sheltered from what has occurred in the real world while not being accountable to it. Changing journalism would change how these people have access to information and that's something I'll be covering near the end of this topic. Now that we've had that transgression, let's go back to Inafune for a bit. We'll go to Inafune, Capcom edition.